Good evening, and welcome to our candidate forum for the Richardson Mayor and City Council election. My name is Jean Richards, President of the League of Women Voters of Richardson. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization which never supports or opposes candidates or political parties. If you are interested in joining the League of Women Voters of Richardson, please pick up one of our membership brochures on the table in the foyer, or fill in a membership form on our website. Membership is open to women and men of all ages. <laughs> Early voting dates and times for both Collin County and Dallas County are in your program. More information about this election, including our printed voters guide and our online voters guide that has additional questions, can be found on the League of Women Voters website at www.lwvrichardson.org. Printed voter guides are available tonight outside on the table in the foyer. They are also available at the Richardson Library, the Fretz Park Branch Library, the Forest Green Branch Library, Audelia Road Branch Library, Huff Hines Recreation Center, Heights Recreation Center, and Richardson Senior Center. The printed voters guide covers both the city council election and the RISD Board of Trustees election, which is why it's located in a number of locations that are not in the city of Richardson. Tonight's forum is being streamed live on www.cor.net and the city's Time Warner Cable Channel 16 and the city's AT&T UVerse Channel 99. The forum will be replayed on TV from April 22nd through May 4th on, tu on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2 p.m. and on Saturdays and Sundays at 6 p.m. The entire forum will also be available, the video, on the League of Women Voters of Richardson's website, again, www.lwvrichardson.org. I'd like to say thank you tonight to our forum organizer, Ellen Steger. She has done a wonderful job this year. And, and as the candidates will attest, as the candidates will, I'm sure, attest, she is a very organized person and very good to work with. Many thanks to the candidates, both for attending our forum this evening and for their willingness to serve. We wish, e wish each of you good luck. The moderator for tonight's forum is Karen Ellis. Instead of doing a verbal introduction, um, I'll direct you to Karen's biography, which is printed in the handout that you had that was with your program tonight. Karen, we really appreciate your volunteering to moderate here tonight. Would you help me welcome Karen Ellis? Thank you, Jean. I cannot tell you what an honor it is to participate uh, with the League in this very important event tonight. The privilege to vote is something we can never, ever take for granted, and the opportunity to hear directly from our candidates is priceless. So thank you to the League for providing this opportunity. There are just a couple of housekeeping rules we'll need to go over. First, silence your cell phone or anything else that makes noise around you. And I, you have to take that up with your spouse, I don't know. Also, be advised that flash photography is not allowed because it's very distracting to our candidates and we want them to be able to focus fully on what they're saying. The format for the question and answer portion uh, of the forum is printed in your program. This is program. So prior to the evening, each candidate agreed to abide by all the ground rules, so we're good to go on that regard. And I want to thank each of the volunteers who are working tonight. That includes the greeters at the door, the tellers that are gathering your questions to bring to the screeners, our screeners here at the table to my left, and the timekeepers who are seated on the front row. OK, now on to the candidates. Please refrain from any applause or other form of support or opposition to any candidate. The purpose of this forum is to hear what they have to say, so please give them as much time and respect as possible. To give you an overview of the job of what the mayor or a city council member entails, please refer to tonight's bio sheet, and that will give you some information on that. The candidates were asked to submit a short biography online to vote411.org. That biography is printed and available tonight for your reading pleasure. Candidates in a contested race are seated on the stage in the order their names will appear on the ballot. They will rotate answering questions first. Candidates who are unopposed 
are invited to give a closing statement this evening, and they are seated on the front row and will be introduced later. And I would like to congratulate each of the candidates who are willing to put themselves forward for public service. It's not an easy thing, and we really appreciate your willingness. So now I'll introduce the candidates in contested races. In ballot order, Mayor, place seven, Ballot position one, Mr. Jared Whedon. Mayor, place seven, ballot position two, Mayor Paul Volker. Velker, I'm sorry, I did it. I knew I was going to do that. Velker. <laughs> Mayor, uh, place four, ballot position one, Corey Montford. Place four, ballot position two, Council Member Mabel Simpson. Place five, ballot position one, member, council member, Marta Gomez Fry. And place five, ballot position two, Kashif Riaz. Okay, now to the question and answer session, what we really came for. Please know that we have had over 20, 25, 30 questions submitted ahead of time. So as your questions come in, our question screeners are working to get the most questions before us as possible. So please be patient with us and understand that they're doing their best. So for our first question. We will start with Mr. Whedon. What one thing does Richardson do well? And what one thing could Richardson do better? Thank you. One thing that Richardson does well is um, the uh, health and safety. We do a good job with the health and safety with the police and firefighters um, and uh, EMTs, get, getting people the coverage that they need. Um, it's so important in a city um, of any size that you make sure that the citizens are, are receiving the support that they need. You know, it's never going to be perfect, um, but we have a, a, a really good uh, fire department, a really good police department, and Richardson does a very good job of making sure that they receive the, the funds and the support that they need. One thing that Richardson really needs to do better um, is to engage the citizens. Uh, in, in my opinion, um, this forum and all previous forums should have been filled. We should have all the citizens interested in coming and seeing uh, what candidates are in front of them and what options that they have. So we need to do a better job of engaging the citizens. Um, and in my opinion, the way to do that is to do in as small a group as possible, go to neighborhoods engage the neighborhoods, talk to the people, see what they want, and also let them know what we're doing as a city um, to improve the city and get their input. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whedon. And I neglected to say that each candidate will have one minute and 30 seconds to answer their question. So, Mr. Velker. The city of Richardson does an excellent job from a financial management standpoint something we are extremely proud of both on council and every citizen I talk to um, takes pride in our AAA bond rating that we have from both Moody's and Standards and Poor's, our clean audits that we get every year, and just the professionalism that our staff has towards managing your money, which is extremely important to all of us in this room. One of the things that I think we probably should do a better job of is dealing with traffic congestion. It's something that I hear an awful lot about. It's not an easy problem to solve given that uh, Collin County alone is expected to grow by 1.5 million people in the next eight to 10 years. But congestion is something that we have to grapple with. Every time we look at programs, projects, we need to understand what the impact's gonna be relative to traffic both inside our city but also very important is the effect that it has from our neighbors, both north, south, east, and west. We are landlocked, and traffic is something that we all share. So those are the two things that I would have. Thank you, Mr. Velker. Ms. Montford. 
One of the things I think that the city does really well at is the parks department, the parks and recreation department. Um, we have great, beautiful landscapes. We're definitely, we're landlocked here in Richardson, so I think we do a, a good job at making sure that we have a large percentage, relatively speaking, for parks and recreation. Um, I think we can do some improvement on walkability there, but uh, I think my main concern for Richardson and its improvement, and, and part of the reason I'm running, is to improve the level of communication that happens with its citizens. So much like Jared Whedon just mentioned, I think we have some apathy going on, and I agree that it would be nice to see more people here. Um, and I think that starts with how we communicate, and certainly as we get a little bit further uh, into 2017, 2018, we're gonna have to think of some creative ways to get that message across. And to make sure that we are proactively listening to the residents before their concerns and not just after. So that is something that I hope to bring to City Council if elected. Thank you, Ms. Simpson. I think one of the best things that the city of Richardson does is it is very fiscally responsible and that's important because those are your taxpayer dollars. And the transparency that goes on within the city is very important and we strive every summer when we go into those budget um, crunch meetings that are long meetings to look at how can we do better, how can we be more efficient, but I think that probably is one of the five star ratings for this city that I've been most impressed with. I think the one thing um, that I think we could do better at is um, with the density that we have, the mobility of moving the citizens around based on the more, more and more people that are moving here and the connectivity between uh, east side to west side underneath the freeways. We have a great walkable community, but I think we can work harder to make those connections across the freeways so that we can connect a lot of our trails. Um, but the mobility is important. Thank you, Ms. Simpson. Ms. Gomez Fry. Thank you. I think one of the things that Richardson does very well is its economic development. So for example, the State Farm Complex is the single largest um, sale in North Texas, in North Texas's history. So Richardson does a very good job about bringing different types of partnerships into increase our economic development opportunities. Um, just on Monday, we spoke about the Collins area, Arapaho Collins area, and how we can find different perspectives on how to to improve that area and bring new businesses, small and large, into the Arapaho Collins area and, in, and again increase our economic development opportunities. So I think that input we do very, very well. I think one of the things that we can improve would probably be our inclusiveness and our multicultural opportunities. We um, have an amazing amount of uh, different cultures and ethnicities represented in our in our city and therefore trying to find ways to celebrate that is something that we can do a lot better. In addition to that, the inclusiveness aspect of, of finding ways to include people with mobility issues or those that may have learning disabilities, finding parks and um, or some of the partnerships that we're looking at right now to be able to improve. Thank you. Mr. Yaz. Hi, thank you. So I reviewed the police report uh, of com crime comparison for 2015 and 16, and our police department done a great job reducing the crime, and uh, our city's financials are looking really good. Uh, I would like to focus on that, uh, what city would like to achieve or we would like to achieve in our next two year term is that uh, we should focus more on um, building indoor swimming pools at part of the recreation center. Uh, I would like to focus more on encouraging and promoting tourism in the city. It becomes uh, a recurring source of revenue and uh, the pride for the city. Uh, um, I am uh, proposing on my platform to have a musical fountains. I mean, I've seen in Dubai, I've seen in Singapore, it is just a magnet to attract uh, tourists. I mean, um, if I need to go to watch a rodeo show, I'm going to go to uh, Fort Worth, Stockton. So um, I'm also uh, think that we should focus on improving the traffic. 
because we are right in the middle between Plano and uh, and the Dallas. And uh, I'm also um, uh, basically would like to focus more on how we can improve the aging infrastructure in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this next question, we will start with you, Ms. Simpson. What Richardson-based civic groups and volunteer organizations do you actively participate in and support? And what leadership roles have you held in those organizations? Thank you. Um, currently, I serve on the city council um, for the past two years, which has been my first term. Historically, I have uh, served on St. Paul School Board, which is the St. Paul Catholic Church and the, and the school that's attached to the church. I served there for seven years. I've served on the hospital board for 10 years. I served on the executive team for seven years out of those 10. I've served on the Cottonwood Creek Drainage Association, actually was one of the founding members of that due to the erosion of the creek beds within the city as it was being utilized as a natural drainage pathway. And um, I served in many capacities, but on director and on the board for the entire time for the Cottonwood Creek Drainage Association, which anyone still here, we fondly refer to that as the ditch authority. <laughs> Furthermore, um, I have served on neighborhood youth and family counseling, and most recently on UTD's Institute of Innovation and Entrepreneurship Board um, in an advisory capacity as one of their advisory board members bringing um, girls going places to UTD for young ladies between eight, uh, grade eight through 12. Thank you, and to you, Ms. Mumford. So I have lived in Richardson for a couple of years now. Lived in DFW for about 20. And so I have served in other cities at different capacities, uh, but this is my first run for office here in Richardson. Um, so I want to point out, though, that I have been on the board for a nonprofit organization for domestic violence survivors. I have worked with the Red Cross, Meals on Wheels. I have worked f with the Bridge, which is a large homeless shelter in Dallas, making sure that they have coats and blankets. And honestly, I've, I've actually helped them obtain jobs. And so uh, the community at large, I feel like I have given back in a significant way and really want to do that here in this city. So I appreciate the opportunity to be able to focus on some of the issues ahead of us. And, you know, I, I'm a licensed professional counselor, and so part of what I want to Part of what I want to do is, uh, is give in the way that I naturally give day to day, which is solving issues across party lines, across uh, race, racial lines, and making sure that we're hearing everybody. Thank you. Mr. Riaz. Hi. Um, I am currently serving as a uh, president of Moroni Farms Homeowners Association. So um, I have a passion for volunteer work. That is one of the reasons I took up this responsibility. So my job is to make sure that the residents are following the HOA bylaws and our community is uh, safe and uh, good to uh, raise families. I'm also very active in, in my uh, mosque religious place in the uh, outreach. So we actively um, engage elected officials in Plano, Richardson, Murphy. We invite them, we invite police officers, we show them who we are. We also invite uh, teachers, lecturers from the community colleges. So I'm proud to, 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 uh, to, uh, to serve these two roles in my as a community uh, advisor. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gomez Fry. Thank you. So I'm a very proud uh, servant of Richardson. Um, in addition to being on city council, I served on the uh, Charter Review Commission uh, with Bob Doobie as our chair. 
Uh, very proud of that. City Plan Commission, I'm on the Education Advisory Committee for um, City Council. I have been a board member of the Network of Community Ministries in addition to an audit committee member there. I am on the Board of Leadership Richardson Alumni Association. I also was in Leadership Richardson Class 26. I am a proud member of our Individual Giving Committee at the Richardson Symphony Orchestra Association, a Junior League Advisory Board of Richardson, Owens Park Neighborhood Association, Association, which I'm very proud of, and also getting involved with the Richardson Women's Club and with Altrusa Richardson. So uh, my background is very much deeply rooted in our community. Thank you. We'll now go to Mr. Volker. Well, it's been my honor to serve on city council for the last, uh, or for four years, the last two as your mayor. Um, I'm a member of uh, my HOA, uh, and I'm the past president of that HOA. I'm uh, currently a member of uh, the Active Crime Patrol in the uh, Panhandle West Side. I've, uh, I, I currently represent Richardson, in the, uh, and I am the Vice President of the Metroplex Mayor's Association. I served on the Zoning Board of Adjustments. I was on the board and served as the Chairman of the Richardson Chamber of Commerce. I served on uh, a uh, Johnson School of Management at UTD for the Industrial Advisory Board. And I was honored to serve on the board of the Tomorrow Foundation for RISD. Thank you. And Mr. Whedon. All right. Um, I participate in my church's volunteer programs. Uh, we have a great history with the city of Richardson of uh, finding citizens who are no longer able to uh, keep up with the uh, code restrictions on their houses, you know, falling into disrepair, and going and doing service work to help um, bring them up to code and do something that they can't do for themselves. Um, previously, um, I've taken part in many uh, volunteer organizations around the DFW area. Um, I've done work with the, with the uh, Salvation Army, Pepsi Kid Around, volunteered time with um, uh, several hospitals around the area, um, as well as many other organizations. Great, thank you. This next question will start with you, Ms. Gomez Fry. The growing number of apartments has been a hot button for Richardson and surrounding areas. Do you foresee additional zoning adjustments to continue to accommodate more apartments, or are we fully saturated at this point? Great question. Um, I think one of the things that we first need to realize is at this time, of the apartments that have been added to the city of Richardson, they are 95% full. So there is a, a need already and a growing need for additional housing units. And so in certain areas of Richardson, those are already allowed by right. These rights were given to developers many, many years before this council was in session. And therefore, there are some areas, for example, uh, the City Plan Commission uh, conducted an investigation last night about a corner of uh, 190 and Custer, a hall development uh, area. And there will be apartments in that area. And there will be a higher density than, um, than, than typical as according to the C C uh, City Planning Commission. So I think for some areas, we are going to see more apartments because again, they are allowed by right. In other areas, we may not. Uh, for example, in the uh, Beltline Main Street area, we're going to see townhomes instead of apartments. So we're not going to be build single family, but we will have some some density issues within our growing community. Thank you, Mr. Riaz. So in my opinion, uh, the land uh, that is left in the city, um, they have the right to uh, to build the apartments, so we cannot stop them. So I think we should uh, positively and proactively uh, address this issue and especially work with the school board so that we can uh, manage the teacher to student ratio and uh, whatever we can do on that area. And obviously if the, we're gonna build more apartments and townhomes, then we have to work on uh, how we are gonna manage uh, the traffic in that area. So I think uh, we can uh, work on this thing positively with a better forecast and with a positive forward-looking approach. Thank you, we'll go to place seven, Mr. Whedon. 
All right, I don't think we need to zone any additional uh, apartments. Uh, they're going to put an additional strain on our current infrastructure, not just our infrastructure, but our, our health and safety. We're going to need more police officers. We're going to need more uh, firemen. We're going to need to be able to fund that. Um, and it's going to use more of our water, and it's also going to uh, put an additional, additional strain on our schools, uh, as uh, Mr. Riaz said. It's going to affect our student to teacher ratio, and we know that that's a, by looking at Dallas, we know that's a recipe uh, uh, for a negative impact on the schools. Um, so if we zone additional uh, multifamily, um, we're, we're, we're going to start running into some problems in a city of our size. We, we need to maintain the infrastructure that we have and uh, make sure that we keep our schools performing on a high level, and uh, I believe we can do this. Thank you. Mr. Valker. So I think uh, apartments are a key component to our um, housing stock. Um, they should not be overlooked or under, under they, they should definitely be understood. Um, in the last five years, we've uh, granted an additional 2,000 uh, apartments, uh, multifamily. Uh, 1,500 of those were actually at UTD, and I would argue that that was a, a, a good zoning choice because I'd rather have faculty, students, and others, staff um, renting apartments at the UTD site than in our neighborhoods, uh, taking rental properties from our single family homes. This is a land rights issue though, at first and foremost, and I'm a strong believer that if it's your land, as long as you're not doing anything illegal, um, you have the rights to do things. So it's first and foremost, uh, my perspective on that. And uh, this council and past councils, I believe, have done a good job of looking at every deal individually. We truly do want these deals to be successful. So when we look at the mix of residential, retail, restaurants, commercial properties, it's important that, uh, that we have the density necessary for that deal to be successful. So when you've seen us actually increase, whether it's 20, 60, 100 additional uh, multifamily, it's because that density is important for the overall success of that project. And it is definitely something that is worth monitoring and measuring because the last thing we want is an unsuccessful project that is only a third or half built out. Thank you. And to place four, Ms. Montford. Well, I think we need diverse housing. We have a diverse population here in Richardson that we're really proud of having. However, I think most people that are concerned with the amount of apartments that are going up is traffic concerns and overcrowding of schools. And certainly there would be some safety concerns. And so those are reasonable concerns. Um, I definitely want to make sure also that we are using quality materials when building the apartments to hold the developers accountable to make sure that we don't have something that we need to completely renovate in less than a decade that won't be used for something else. Uh, I also believe that we could make sure that we have the walkability factor so they can utilize the dart rail line, they have their goods and sundries available, and so to, to, to ensure that the people that live in the apartments have the things that they need around them so the traffic is minimized. One last thing I want to say is that I don't believe we need to be incentivizing apartment developers at all. I think most developers would be chomping at the bit to have to, to come to Richardson, so giving them a tax incentive doesn't seem appropriate. Okay, Ms. Simpson. Um, I think it's very important to understand um, the question involved whether or not there was saturation in our city. And I think it's difficult to quantify saturation with regard to multifamily because um, these particular entitlements or rights for multifamily were placed on some of these properties as long ago as the 50s and some more in the 70s and more further in the 80s. And as a responsible council for this city, it's very important that we look at what the entitlements are 
that are already layered onto the properties and we embrace that development ourselves. And we engage with that developer so that we can make sure that what we're bringing is not just multifamily, but it is also the mixed use that can be supported. We've worked on the code. Something's wrong with my microphone. <laughs> We've worked on the code to make sure the building materials are sustainable and the highest quality as the technology evolves. We, too, will continue to make those particular um, products that they have to incorporate into these developments the top of the line, but it's important to understand we can't quantify sustainable. We have to engage what's already there because we are not going to purchase those rights back, but we will work with the developers to make it something that we can live with within our city and that is in hand in glove with the comprehensive plan we have as a vision for the citizens after listening to all their concerns with regard to mobility. Thank you. We'll now take the next question to place seven, starting with Mr. Velker. In today's increasingly diverse and partisan political climate, how do you intend to ensure our council continues to govern in a nonpartisan manner with decisions based not on party politics, not on party politics, but in the best interest of our city? I've often told people that it's not a good time to be a politician. Um, at the federal, state, county, and city levels, the discourse that we have today is challenging. It can almost be frightening. And I'm a firm believer in the, uh, the constitutional rights that were given to this city uh, through the 1912 Constitutional Amendment giving us home rule. In that amendment, we then voted to take that on as a city and form a charter. In that charter, it specifically states that it'll be nonpartisan with respect to the way that we govern this city and run for these offices. And in reality, there's a good reason for that, because I do believe that at the local level, streets are streets, sewers are sewers, trash collection is trash collection. The way we run this city Every citizen has concerns, and every citizen views most of these services in the same way with respect to the debate is to what level these services do we have, how do we fund them, and how do we move forward to make a really great community. Those aren't partisan issues, and I, uh, I absolutely love being in a political environment that is not partisan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whedon. All right, and not to repeat myself, but uh, we need citizen involvement. Uh, we need people from every neighborhood and every ethnic group that resides in our city to come and have their voices heard so we can know what they want, what, what's important to them, and then we can you know, distill that information and, and find out what works best for the city with keeping their needs and desires in mind because th this is a group, you know, that we're, we're a, a government by the people. So we need to make sure that we're doing what the people want and we're representing the people correctly. Um, the way the council is set up right now is actually more, it, it is conducive to that. We don't have people that are, we don't have, you know, council members that are just worried about representing just their one little section of the city. They understand that they're representing the whole city and that they're accountable to everyone in the city. Um, so, thanks. Okay, now moving to place four, starting with you, Ms. Simpson. I think Paul hit the nail on the head that it is, um, on the federal and state level, it is very um, divided right now. But I think that's opportunity for we at the local level to make a difference because I think it's very important to understand whatever happens and change happens at the local level. So I think we can be the, um, we can be the example and not the continued rhetoric, but the example to see that all of our city services, they're not partisan based. Um, the city services are necessary for the core services that are delivered to the citizens, and it is our responsibility as your council to make sure that your taxpayer dollars are fiscally monitored and we deliver those services. But I do believe 
we change everything at a local level and it's very, very important that everyone vote. I would love to see more people come out and vote, but again, I think it's very important that we make the difference on a local level and we can do that on a nonpartisan way in our community. Thank you, and now place five, Mr. Riaz. Whoops, whoops, I'm so sorry. Place four, Ms. Mumford, would you care to answer? I would, as long as my mic works this time, I hope so. Okay, the reality is our political climate is in crisis. We have neighbors, we have friends, we have communities, that feel at odds with one another. And that's partly why I decided to run, because day in and day out, I am talking with families that are at odds with one another. So my goal is to help mend that by providing effective communication, strong leadership, and looking at the bigger picture and making sure that various concerns are heard. Now, I started hearing people when I started my campaign here in Richardson. And categorically, I have been hearing the similar concern, which is, but my neighborhood isn't being heard. And so that is something that I want to bring, is an opportunity to be heard an opportunity to understand that there are fears around what, what the political climate is and how that affects them in our community. I think people get really comfortable when they wanna, they wanna slap a label on you, but I think labels tend to shut people down instead of try to understand. Thank you. Now, Mr. Riaz. Yeah. Nowadays, the political climate at the federal level and the state level is very divisive, but I think um, at the city level, it is our responsibility because we have the first-hand interaction, meeting with people, and uh, providing the necessary services like a police, fire, and uh, you know, taking care of streets and everything. So I think if any resident is going to call 911, the police officer or the fire uh, Fireman is not going to ask that are you a Democrat or Republican, so they are they have, they are going to take care of that emergency, right? So, and same thing with the water and other utilities. If city is enforcing certain code violations for the structures or other things or or sign control and other things, that is for the best interest for all the residents of the city at large. So I think that um, our city is uh, doing a great job. And we have two at-large uh, uh, council members, and uh, we have four from different zones. So I think we are doing great, in, in my opinion. Thank you. And Ms. gomez Fry. So as the question stated about how would we deal with continuing the nonpartisan opportunities in our on city council for our city. I think we use the amazing examples that we have around us uh, to help us with that. League of Women Voters, nonpartisan group. Altrusa, nonpartisan. Volunteers in Police Service, nonpartisan. They're all here helping us, maintaining opportunities for us to learn from each other, to hear each other, to be able to collaborate with each other in a way that does not mean that we're red or we're blue. We are all Richardson citizens. And when we talk about city politics, it's about the city. It's not about the politics. It's about what we can do as members of this community to help each other grow. And so I think those are the ways that we can maintain a nonpartisan opportunity within our council and within our community. Thank you. Ms. Mumford, we're going to start with you this time. OK. Many citizens perceive there to be a historic east side, west side divide in Richardson, with the west side getting more attention from the city. Do you think this is the case? And if so, what would you do about it if elected? That's a good question. I happen to live on the west side. I live in Canyon Creek. And 
I, uh, I do feel, like I stated in my last answer, when I started talking with the various sections of Richardson and various communities and asking people what their concerns were, that was high on the list. Uh, feeling like they don't get as much attention, whether their roads aren't taken care of and whether they just have fast food places and not nice sit down places where they feel like they're having to drive to North Richardson, et cetera. Um, and so I think that that absolutely can be improved. Um, I'm hoping to at least suggest, if elected, virtual town hall meetings where people can get more involved and participate in city council meetings a little more easily, and also to promote them getting more involved at their HOA level. So when we talk to the HOA presidents and leadership teams that they are able to tell us exactly how we are not paying attention to their communities. So I think it's a, I think it's a legitimate concern. Okay, thank you. And your response, Ms. Simpson? The east side, west side, again, our community was started in the 50s. And um, it's very important to understand. I mean, I grew up, I moved here when I was four, so 54 years ago in the southwest or southwest quadrant on Dumont Drive. And the older side of the city is on the west side, excluding what we have in the old Main Street area. And I think it's important that everyone understand that every street is evaluated. And you start with the worst to the best. And when we evaluate what we can afford with regard to improved infrastructure and roads, et cetera, it's important to take the worst first and progressively get to the best as we can afford it. And the Main Street area is being focused in redevelopment because of the hard work of the partnership between the Chamber and the City. Finding those redevelopment partners that can come in and, ex and spend that money to redevelop the, the older portions of the city. The east side is, is a newer development. And I say newer, it's all relative since we started here in the 50s. So it's important to look at what, where that graduated grade is as far as worst to best and how those things are allocated. Thank you. And to place five, Ms. gomez Fry. Thank you. So every 10 years, according to our charter, we reevaluate our boundaries and for the four places that have specific um, council members. So that is something that is balanced to make sure that everyone, every demographic and every geography has an equal balanced number of people so that they all have a voice. In addition to those four individual council members, you have three others that are at large, the mayor and the two. So there's a lot of opportunity for uh, everyday citizens to come to council member meetings, come talk to us. But in addition to that, on a monthly basis, the city of Richardson meets with every HOA president and their second in charge um, to discuss those types of issues, to get a what's going on in the city, what's going on with construction, which new uh, roads are going to be rebuilt, what new alleys are going to be approached, and what are the concerns of each neighborhood and how we can come together to help remedy those, those concerns. So I think um, when we're talking about east side, west side, there's a lot of opportunities to continue that dialogue and to continue to improve those, those, um, those situations and the questions that we may have of, about concerns. Okay, and Mr. Riaz. So I think uh, whenever we expand uh, the development in any city, um, for the most part, it's going to be an organic development, means any structure that has to be built, there should be a purpose, there should be a, some kind of a source of revenue and some kind of a utilization, right? And let's say on the east side, if the investors are holding the land and lots and not doing anything, they may have a reason that, you know, population is not growing or maybe the business is not growing. So in short, I think uh, um, the organic uh, development, the forces of uh, the market forces are going to eventually balance out everything. Um, as Marta said, I'm a president of the HOA. I mean, I attend uh, a meeting once a month and uh, city manager and everybody is briefing us what is going on and what is the future plans are. So uh, in my opinion, we are doing okay. Uh, if uh, east side is not that developed, 
the market forces will eventually balance out those things in future. Thank you. Thank you. And now to place seven, Mr. Whedon. So I lived on uh, near Beltline and Bowser. I grew up over there, uh, over on the east side. Um, and then I also lived over near Breckenridge Park. And when my wife and I got married and we wanted to buy a house, we bought a house in Northridge. So I, I, I've been in you know, a, a many diverse places in Richardson, and I know that there's, there are different needs for each side. So much like what I said earlier and, and similar to uh, what Ms. Mumford said, I believe we need to really get boots on the ground in these neighborhoods. We need to go and we need to talk to uh, the citizens of the neighborhoods, not, not, not just the HOA presidents, but we need to talk to the citizens. Uh, we need to find out what's important to them. Um, and then we need to evaluate those needs amongst the city. And then if, if for whatever reason their neighborhood is gonna end up being on a lower priority, we need to go to their neighborhood again and tell them that our reasoning for, well, we need to do this first. And it, it won't be a comfortable conversation, I, I, I'm sure. But at least we're communicating with them and telling them why something got prioritized above them and let them know that there's strong reasoning behind it and that we're not just ignoring them. Thank you, Mr. Velker. So like Jared, I've wandered around the city. Um, I lived in uh, Canyon Creek for 18 years and I've lived uh, now near uh, Breckenridge Park for the last 10 years. Um, you know, it's a, uh, <laughs> there are people in every neighborhood and as mayor, trust me, I get, I get the emails who think they're probably underserved. Um, and if I'm living in their neighborhood, oftentimes I would probably sit there and say the exact same thing. We do have a very professional staff that uses proper methodology in approaching and delivering services. We call it the Richardson way. We plan the work and work the plan. One of the things that I'm hypersensitive to as mayor is that I cannot allow myself as a, an elected official to override those professionals who are putting those plans together and working them. It's a terrible way to potentially turn things off from a, uh, a planning process. It's a waste of resources and it could slow and raise the cost of any program implementation. Um, you know, I, I have an individual who may be in the audience who sent me 550 mails uh, in the last year and a half um, on, on his <clears throat> roads and alleys. Um, he's on the plan, but uh, he may not like where he's on the plan, and we have explained. And it's more than just me reaching out to the HOA presidents. Every one of us on council has made trips to each of the HOAs and met individually on a regular basis. Thank you. Our next question will start with you, Mr. Riaz. Currently, the city of Richardson only regulates payday loan businesses by requiring them to get a special zoning permit. Do you support passing an ordinance to regulate payday loans in Richardson by requiring registration, restricting extensions of credit, and imposing record keeping requirements? Why or why not? And we start with you, Mr. Riaz. Thank you. So um, we, I think in, I'm in favor of expanding uh, the legislative uh, powers of the city on this area. Um, the payday lenders, they know that the borrowers are very vulnerable and uh, sometimes they are not that educated when you go apply for a line of credit loans at the corporate level. So they are gonna use the vulnerability and the innocence of those borrowers and they will try to uh, exploit and charge higher interest rate and the late fees and everything. So 100% I'm in agree. Uh, we can expand the legislation what we have at the state level and protect the citizens in our city. Thank you, Ms. gomez Fry. Thank you. So the reason why the city of Richardson uses the special use permit methodology is because there is no state law to prohibit this type of business in our area. There is no law that says that we cannot, that we have to restrict a certain type of business practice. Um, there are preferences that we have as a city, but as a business right, they have a right 
to do business in different areas. And so we as a city have adopted this methodology to have them come before us and prove to us that they are the type of business that we that, that is the appropriate in our city and then we can say yes or no. So that has been the methodology. Um, I am for business rights. Um, I'm a small business advocate, and so not that this is a big business or a small business, but it's important for me to look at, at um, issues on a case-by-case -case basis. And so for me, it's, it's, uh, I'm follow, I want to follow the law, and the law right now has not caught up with the predatory lending practices that we see today. Thank you. Place seven, Mr. Velker. I agree that payday loans are a challenge. There's predatory practices that are actually being practiced. Um, but I also believe that there's roles and responsibilities in government. I'm a firm believer in local control, as I stated earlier. But what that also means is that other governmental bodies need to have their roles and responsibilities well understood. I believe in sticking in your swim lane. The financial industry regulatory environment sets square, uh, squarely in both the federal and state level. There are actually state laws today that are pretty firm on the practices necessary for a payday loan. The challenge is the state isn't enforcing those laws. And like so many other opportunities the state can put on us through fun, unfunded or underfunded mandates, it's easy for them to turn to us and say, solve that problem. Well. I'm not prepared to put a staff person in place or two that would take um, an education on financial industry practices so that we can go out and enforce those state laws. We do use the SUP process and we have not increased any of the payday loans uh, for the last for seven, eight years uh, easily. And uh, I'm also not a big fan of putting in what in effect could end up being feel-good legislation when we will not, would not be in a position to enforce those rules. Um, I'm not a fan of, uh, of regulatory uh, types of situations just to do it. Thank you. Mr. Whedon, your response? Payday loan companies are, like others have said, generally a, a predatory group. They're taking advantage of people who are in a difficult situation and claiming they're providing a service that's not otherwise available to these people. But of course, at extremely high interest rates and, uh, it, and it gets worse after, there, uh, after that point. Um, but as others have stated, uh, this is something that isn't really feasible to be handled at the city level. You're, you're gonna end up um, having lawsuits that you're gonna have to pay for out of the citizens' money to have the city attorney who, or whoever else uh, go and fight these battles. What we need to do is we need to work with state officials or you know even really national officials to get more restrictions on these groups so that are these companies so that they're not able to take advantage of people like this. And if they really want to provide a service, to do it in a, a, a reasonable way. Thank you. Thank you. Now, place five, Ms. Simpson. Place four, but I'll take oh, that. Oh, four. <laughs> I'm so excited about this. <laughs> um, I'm not a strong believer in um, more legislation and more ordinances passed for um, basically commanding behaviors. Um, I am not a fan of payday lending at all, but I am, as Marta had articulated, I'm very much a um, person who believes in the law as it is written now and businesses, and you can't just legislate businesses out the door, you will strike lit litigation. Um, I have a full-time law practice and a title company, and I will tell you, there are some lenders for real estate in the mortgage industry that loan at very, very, very high prices. And my philosophy is, well, there's always a lender for someone because the people that are utilizing these sources of lending that are the customers, they don't have alternatives that they know of, but I have had meetings with different community leaders on this particular subject specifically. And I don't believe an ordinance is the way to do it. I don't believe you continue to legislate things like this. I think that you, you change the behavior 
the behavior as you reach out to help those people and these the mostly church leaders have decided to teach more fiscal responsibility within their community of churches to help those people that feel like their back is against the wall to find some other alternatives because this business will go away on its own because it's supply and demand. If there's no demand, it will fade to the sunset. But if we pass an ordinance, they're gonna go across the street to another city. Or if we say you're now non-conforming, they can stay non-conforming for years. Thank you. Ms. Montford. Well, this is near and dear to my heart. Um, I am very concerned about the predatory lending that's happening all across the Metroplex, but certainly in the city that I love, Richardson. So do I support all the things that the question mentioned? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Because we, when you are dealing with vulnerable people that aren't reading maybe the fine print of the 500% that they're going to have to pay back, and they're in crisis, and they don't know where to go. So yes, I agree, we could be, do a better job at maybe listing some resources, and I know that churches have been trying to do this and educate consumers as well. But we are keeping them disadvantaged, we are keeping them vulnerable, and that doesn't help anybody, and it certainly doesn't help our city. So I think that we need to continue to lobby at the state level to make sure that the legislation is written to protect our citizens. And even from a financial perspective for our city, when we are giving away essentially their revenue from their jobs to outside people, that's not helpful for us revenue-wise either for Richardson. Thank you. Okay, our next question, we will start with Place seven, Mr. Whedon. In regards to communication with the city citizens of Richardson, what can you do better to engage millennials and other ethnicity groups in Richardson as well as our senior citizens? All right, I don't want to start sounding like a broken record here, but we need to get into the neighborhoods, each individual neighborhood. Uh, and you know, there, there are people who don't participate in the uh, and their HOAs, and it would be great if everybody did participate in it. But there's, especially the people that are, are more reclusive, aren't gonna be participating in their HOAs. What we need to do is get down into those neighborhoods and provide opportunities for those people to you know, tell us what we can do for them. And we can tell them what the city can do for them. <laughs> uh, and you know, it, it, it's, it's a difficult process. Yes, it takes time, but it's worth it. It's worth it to make the city stronger, to grow the city together, to get everybody on the same page, and if not on the same page, to at least get everybody understanding what we're doing. Thank you. Mr. Belker. Communications is always a challenging uh, aspect of any organization, including cities. And uh, the great news is that Richardson is an extremely diverse city. Uh, the demographics are evolving and changing. Um, the groups here, the millennials, ethnic groups, and our seniors represent three of the largest specific uh, aspects of our demographics. And they all have different challenges and will probably all take different levels of, and types of communications. Um, on the millennial side, we do need to do a better uh, job of, of leveraging social media and other aspects of networking pr uh, that they, they are so good at and that, uh, that we need to do uh, uh, a better job of engagement on. From an ethnic uh, multicultural standpoint, um, one of the things that, uh, uh, an example being in our police department, having officers that speak multiple languages or having language as, of multiples uh, that are available. And I do think we need to increase that uh, capability within our police department. But also multi-language support uh, for our websites and other aspects of information that might be going out and being sensitive to those particular communities from a cultural standpoint also. And for our seniors, I think, uh, you know, I'll just keep working it. Um, th this is where our largest pool of volunteers come from. This is the group that is extremely engaged in our community. 
but they have specific needs also, and we need to make sure we're listening to those as, as that number quite candidly continues to increase as, as noted by the number of exemptions we give. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Montfort. Well, this is the main part of my platform is communication, so I could talk a lot longer than 90 seconds about it. But before talking, we should listen. And before we make big decisions that affect a community, we need to be listening. So listening happens when people can come together and talk to you. And the way that happens is getting the word out. And we definitely have some growth to do in that regard. We have got to take advantage of more of the digital platforms uh, like social media. Our website could use an overhaul. It needs to be more user friendly. Most of the demographics in Richardson are under 50 years old. And we communicate that way. We communicate through text reminders, we communicate through Twitter, we communicate through Facebook, and so getting people more engaged on that level is gonna be really important. Um, I also think the multicultural aspect is, uh, an, is something that, you know, they are, they, they are so welcoming and so wanting us to engage and understand what they're doing over there and all that stuff, I, I feel like we could, have maybe a multicultural festival along with our Cottonwood and Wildflower Festivals um, to really help promote what we have going on here in Richardson. Thank you, and Ms. Simpson. I love that Richardson has the spectrum from the seniors all the way to the millennials and the new people that are moving here for the jobs. Um, I'm a firm believer that technology is a great asset to our community, but I'm also a firm believer of checking them at the door and having the old fashioned way of the front porch communication, which I think the seniors bring. And the millennials don't so much know how much we enjoy that, and they then begin to enjoy it when that occurs. I would love to see more of the front porch philosophy together, but also engaging the millennials to teach the seniors how to use that technology. Um, and I'm not saying we, you know, that they all don't know how to use it, but the bottom line is it changes so rapidly and it's like, it changes faster and faster as the time progresses. But with regard to the multicultural, I will tell you, there are so many festivals in this city. We have been embraced by the uh, Muslim community, we've been embraced by the Chinese community and the Chinese Taiwanese uh, community that are having their festival, by the way, this Saturday in their community. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate the exposure to their cultures because it's fascinating. And they love having us come and they love coming to our functions as well. So that part about Richardson I love because you go to other parts of the city and it's, it's, it's compartmentalized and we're not that way. Thank you, and now Ms. Gormas Fry. Okay, how many of you guys remember the old-fashioned phone tree, right? We used to call one person, and that person would call two people, and those two people would call two people. I think we have an incredible network already set up in Richardson through the many organizations that, that volunteer and take part in our community. So in addition to improving our website for the city and improving our seven different types of ways the city communicates with its members, there's an opportunity for us through uh, yoga at City Line to have information there, or whether the, the Dallas Chinese Community Theater, which is in, uh, Community Center, which is in Richardson, or through Network of Community Ministries, to be able to get communication pushed out to them and then they can get it out to the different types of age groups, the different types of needs, and the different types of issues that are really hoping to get more input and impact into our city. Thank you. Mr. Riaz. Thank you. So um, it is on my campaign platform also that I'm proposing to increase the property tax exemption for seniors by $5,000. I am also a licensed realtor and licensed loan officer. So I, 
I do have a forecast where the market trends are and what will be the prices of the real estate in next uh, 10 to 15 years, right? So we want to make Richardson affordable for our seniors because they are living with a fixed income. Um, I travel to 11 different countries uh, in my life um, and I have a very good expo international exposure of different metropolitan cities also. Um, um, on my campaign platform, I am also proposed that we should have uh, a, we should promote uh, tourism in the city. So I am proposing to have a uh, uh, you know musical fountains that is a good source of uh, attraction uh, in the city. Um, as you can see that uh, we are slowly moving towards a sharing economy. We are sharing cars. We are sharing uh, uh, you know rooms. The millennium generation is also thinking that way. So I'm also proposing to build uh, or revitalize the aging uh, buildings where you can have we can you can provide a neighborhood concept where you have you have grocery stores or small shops downstairs and you have small apartments upstairs and millenniums can share that and they can just walk downstairs if they do not want to drive and do groceries and then go back up. So we can you know share these ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much. The evening is speeding by, and we are to our last question at this point before we do closing statements. So we will start with you, Ms. Simpson. What's your opinion regarding Richardson being declared a sanctuary city for undocumented aliens? Do I have an opinion if we are, or are you stating that we are? What's your opinion regarding Richardson being declared a sanctuary city for undocumented aliens? Well, Richardson is not a sanctuary city for undocumented aliens. It's important to understand how ICE delivers those particular holding orders. Um, a sanctuary city is a city who declares that they refuse to enforce the federal law. That is not the city of Richardson. The ICE orders that come down are today are specifically requests. They are not orders from a court. And as a practicing attorney, you move on an order from the court. Once that gets elevated to an order from the court, then in fact you have the ability to hold that person so that they can be taken into custody by ICE. But a request does not, does not have the same capacity or enforcement as an order. Therefore, you can't hold somebody past their legal time to be held without another court order. Right now, ICE sends out requests, so we are not a sanctuary city, and I can guarantee you that that's not going to happen in the city of Richardson under the current watch of this council because we honor and enforce the law. Thank you, Ms. Montford. I hope that we can always work together through chains of government, from the national to the state to our municipal government. Um, and so sanctuary cities is a far more complicated question than I feel like I have time for, but I, I definitely don't see that that is a possibility or even a thought in our city for Richardson um, in the coming future. So I, I'm support, I, I support all chains of government uh, supporting one another. Thank you. Mr. Riaz. <clears throat> Thank you. So uh, I agree with uh, Mabel Simpson. So we would like to keep our uh, city as a non-sanctuary city. And we should just follow the, uh, the laws that is uh, upon us from the federal level at the state level. Thank you. Ms. gomez Fry. I think it's very important for our city, for our state, for our nation to protect the rights of any individual that is in our and our borders. So immigrants are very important to anyone just as we are as citizens of Richardson. But until there are court mandated orders for us to 
do, a, do our work differently, the city of Richardson is gonna follow the law. And, and it's a very important methodology and a lot of conversations have taken place um, with our legal counsel uh, on this subject so that we do not take this very lightly. Uh, the police department is involved, the city uh, attorney is involved to make sure that we are following the letter of the law as best that we can to be protective and inclusive of everyone in our community. Thank you, and to place seven, Mr. Velker. Uh, no, we're not a sanctuary city, nor do we plan to be one. Um, but having said that, all immigrants, um, I believe, want to come to this great country for a, a really good reason, and that is that we have rule of law. And uh, because of that, we are a safe, vibrant, economically developed country that is, is you know, the, the entire world looks to. Richardson as a city is actually a, a leader in the interagency uh, collaboration that's necessary. So our police department works closely with the county and the state and the federal government, and I've witnessed those kinds of uh, interagency communications and, uh, and uh, activities that go on on a daily basis. Um, because of some of the activity that ICE has had, especially recently after the, the new administration has come in, I've uh, developed even a stronger relationship as mayor with the council generals of both uh, Mexico and Canada and uh, work with them um, as needed to help both our country and the agencies necessary to deal with these issues and the governments of both Mexico and uh, Canada so that we truly understand what these issues are and how to work in a collaborative fashion to, to make it happen um, in the most effective way, but also in the most fair way. Thanks. Thank you. And finally, Mr. Whedon. Richardson doesn't need to become a, a sanctuary city. Uh, we need to honor state and federal laws. Uh, we certainly don't need to go out and, and knock door to door and go seeking illegal aliens to pull them out of their homes and, and such. What, what, and, you know, it's not fiscally or, uh, or uh, financially responsible for the city to try and do that. Um, if somebody commits a crime and we get a request to hold them, absolutely, we need to, we need to honor that and to make sure that, that we're doing our part to protect our citizens. Okay, great. Um, our time for questions has expired, and so we will move to our closing statements. But first, thank you, audience, for such uh, thought-provoking questions, and thank you to the candidates for such thoughtful and passionate answers. So our closing statements will be made in reverse ballot order. Each candidate will have two minutes for a closing statement, and this will include our unimposed, unopposed candidates as well. And we'll begin with place six, Steve Mitchell, council member, who is unopposed. Come on up to the podium. Well, one thing you can always guarantee, you never know where you're gonna be. Um, last time I was last, and you know what, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. So anyway, I wanna thank you for allowing me to come and all of us to be here tonight. You know, I want to thank the, the League, I want to thank Ellen Steger, I want to thank those of you who are here tonight and those who are watching, because what we've heard tonight is we want to continue to engage our communities, and I think we're seeing that tonight. When I uh, joined the council 12 years ago, uh, two of which I served as mayor, um, I had some specific goals, which was to repair and replace infrastructure, redevelopment of our aging uh, shopping centers and multifamily. Um, we wanted to keep our small businesses and grow our big business, our larger businesses. And we wanted to promote Richardson as the place to live. Well, I wanna tell you that I, it's really been a privilege to serve these past 12 years because what we've seen is we've seen voter approved general obligation bonds for over $150 million that have addressed many infrastructure issues. We still have some to go, but, we, but we've made a lot of progress. Um, we've enhanced the amenities. You know, you see the gymnastic center, you see new rec centers, you see the expansion of the, of the Spring Creek nature area. Um, 
You also see clean audits. You see a AAA bond rating, which makes a huge difference in our borrowing. You know, we want to promote and make Richardson the place for people to want to live and to work. You know, my family moved here in 1965, and many of you heard this speech over the last 12 years. And we moved here because of the schools and because of the quality of life. And I can tell you that people continue to do that today. But what I want to continue to do as your council member for Place 6 is to continue that in the future. And I believe that we have been successful and we're going to continue to do so. And unfortunately, my last line was, was stolen, but I'm just going to say it anyway, is we have the Richardson way is that we work our plan, we plan our work and we work our plan. So thank you. And I ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you. And now for place five on stage, we'll start with Kashif Riaz. Hi. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. I'm living in Richardson for 10 years with my wife and two kids. Um, I would like to contribute to the future growth of the city of Richardson. I love Richardson. It is a great place to live with the schools and the, the diverse community we have. It is right in the middle uh, between Dallas and Plano. It, it gives you a very suburban look. Uh, I am working for IBM as a senior technology specialist. I have a 16, 17 years of uh, technology career. In the past, I served as a founder and the president of a staffing company for five years. It gives me a good uh, executive experience, business management and business development experience. I'm also working as a president of uh, Maroney Farms uh, Homeowners Association. I have a passion for volunteer work. That is one of the reasons I took up this role. I'm also very active in the outreach committee in the mosque. Uh, we actively uh, engage uh, elected officials. In some of the events, I, I invited the uh, respected council members of the city of Richardson also. Um, on my campaign platform, I'm proposing to uh, provide some uh, tax exemptions to the seniors because of the increased cost of living because of prices are going up. And uh, I'm also proposing to revitalize our aging infrastructure. I'm also proposing some low hanging fruits uh, like, uh, you know, have some benches in the downtown area so that we have more uh, tourist friendly place. I'm also proposing uh, have a colorful uh, crosswalks. I'm also proposing uh, some zoning codes to prevent flooding in the parking lots. Uh, I'm also proposing to promote tourism in the city of Richardson. And uh, one of the low budget things, not like the Disney World, but we can start with some kind of a musical fountain. It just uh, catch a lot of uh, visitors on the weekends, on the weekdays also. So I'm seeking your vote. Please support my campaign. And thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be on the ballot. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Riaz. Marta Frey Gomez. Thank you. Marta Thank Gomez you. Frey. I'll get this stuff right really well. Oh, good. Frey. I can't do it. <laughs> Karen, you've done an outstanding job. Thank you for your efforts. <laughs> Thank you to the league. This has been an amazing experience, and, and we really appreciate your leadership. Thank you for coming. Um, this, is, this is an amazing opportunity for all of us. And, um, to be to talk to you to talk to you about who we are and what we believe in um, i would love your vote because i am a proven leader that has worked through positive actions to achieve measurable results as your city council member as um, the city charter review i'm one of you i work with mary badoski on small business issues i work with jerry nichols every month on the hoa president i have duck pride with carmen herndon because i'm very proud um, you know i am part of the community and so in working with the richardson symphony orchestra or working with the richardson women's club it's given me an opportunity to really be a part of hopefully what I hear from you and what you need and what I can be able to provide as leadership up here and on City Council. I am a serial volunteer. I am a serial connector and I would like to continue my opportunities connecting you, the businesses and the resources in Richardson together for to make us all prosper. Thank you. And now place four, Mabel Simpson. I would like to reiterate um, a thank you, a huge thank you to the League of Women Voters. Y'all have done a great job, and this is um, a huge volunteer effort, so I appreciate that. 
I also would like to thank every one of you for coming. Um, I'm sure you have better things to do on an evening like tonight, but I want to tell you how important it is to us that that think enough to take the time to run, that you all care enough to show up and listen to what we have to say. And I do appreciate that. It's been an honor to serve for two years. Um, I, my wheelhouse as a, as a real estate attorney, um, my tagline is the differences in the detail because everything I deal with is documentary evidence 99% of the time. So dealing on city council has been great because there is a lot of detail that you have to look at and, and go into and take the time to be prepared for what's being presented. Because the people that are bringing these presentations and developers to this city, by the time they get to council, they have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in engineering and design fees and working with the city staff. All those people that they've hired as professionals selling time, they've spent a lot of time and effort and it's very important that we take the time committed to review what they've presented and make sure that we make informed decisions that are in the best interest of our community based on the detail that's presented. I'm willing to commit that time and I do think it has been a great experience for me. I've enjoyed it and I would like to carry on for two additional years serving in a capacity to represent all the, the citizens of Richardson. Thank you. Thank you. Corey Montford. Well, thank you for being here. Anytime um, residents give their time and attention to learn more about their community and potential leaders, I find it really encouraging. And I also want to thank the League of Women Voters for giving us this platform to be able to express our vision for the city. Bottom line, I feel like effective communication is the backbone of strong leadership and healthy systems. And as a professional counselor, that's what I do day in and day out, is I help people work through difficult conversations, hard topics, they feel overwhelmed, they don't feel heard, and I help people feel heard and come to a resolution that usually works for both parties. And so I also think that my business skills, and I didn't talk much about that tonight, but I understand the need to balance long-term financial goals with short-term needs. And I also understand the importance of needing to collaborate and work as a team. But I want every resident, no matter gender, race, nation of origin, sexual preference, religious faith, I want them to feel like they have a home here in Richardson and that they have a strong voice in our city government. I believe I have the experience and education to help our growing and diverse city of Richardson progress forward. And it sincerely would be my privilege to represent you on city council in place four and vote May 6th. Thank you. We'll now have place three, council member Scott Dunn, who is unopposed. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Lee. Thank you, folks, for coming showing up. Uh, I'm Scott Dunn. I'm in place three. I'm unopposed. I've ser served on city council now for th six years. Uh, Y'all, who know me know I'm a big co uh, college fan, sports fan, and LSU is my team. So you, you, you ask, you know, what does that have to do with the city council and stuff? So let me tell you, we had a hard decision uh, back at the beginning of the football season. We fired our coach who had been there for 11 years, 77% winning and a national title. So you go, what does that have to do with, with uh, city council and this? You reach a plateau and you can't go any further. So you look at Alabama's coach, constantly winning, constantly moving forward. As much as I dislike Coach Saban, I do admire the guy as a coach. So you ask us what we've done in our incense on council. You know, we're ranked number one city council in the state of Texas. We have eight years of AAA bond rating. 
We've increased the senior exemption to $80,000 and just 10,000 this last year. We've lowered the tax rate on all citizens. Our retail vacancy since 2012 has dropped to 6% from the high at 14%. We've increased our parks 125 acres since 2011. We've added new places like the fruit truck place, uh, Alamo Draft House, Four Bullets, Free Play. So we've added a lot. We have developers having confidence in us in Richardson to build a half billion dollar in uh, development. We've increased our maintenance on our streets. I could go on and on, but this is a great team. I look for your vote on May 6th. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. For place two, Mayor Pro Tem Mark Solomon, also unopposed. Well, everybody's thanked everybody. Everybody said what we've done over the last few years, so I'm just here to say thank you. Uh, the league, y'all have done an excellent job again this year. And all of you, this is the Richardson Way. This is the Richardson Way. We're here tonight participating in our government and doing the things that will make our community a better place for us all to live. And so I appreciate you being out here. I could go on and enumerate some other things that Scott left out, but we've, we, we've just done a, a good job. Uh, I'm very pleased. I, I, I'll just stand on the record of this city council to anyone who wants to talk about it that we are doing the things that you and I, remember, we all live here. I, I love to get these emails saying, you know, I've, you know I pay my taxes. I, I do mine too, you know. Uh, Charlie, you pay yours, don't you? So, so, you know, we all do that. We're part of the community. My grandkids are here. My kids are here. You know, we're part, of, we, we are Richardson, all of us. And we have a great time and we enjoy our community. And I've enjoyed, really, I thoroughly love my service to this community. I, I, I love to do, you know, the reason I was late tonight, I, I had another dinner before this to get here before here. So, you know, and you can tell I do love to eat, uh, at all the new restaurants. When we ran in 2009, when we ran in 2009, everybody wanted more restaurants. We've given it to you. Got a little traffic to go along with it. We're trying to work on that, but we're working on those problems. So I thank you for the opportunity to serve you. Look forward to doing it for another two years. Have a good night, and thank you for being here. That was unenthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and now for mayor, which is also known as Place 7, Paul Velker. Oh, what did I do? I left off Bob Doobie. Now, Bob and I go way back, so it's okay. <laughs> right, Coach? <laughs> yes. Well, they, they told me that place one would be last tonight instead of going first, and they're saving the best for last. So I can tell you that I don't know if I'm the best, but I'll be, give you the best effort. I'm unopposed. I'm excited about running. Uh, my parents moved here in 1955 and I was a tiny child back then, I promise you. Uh, so I have a lot of energy, a lot of passion for the city. My children have moved their families here. They live here, I've got grandkids here, and I'm just excited to be part of the number one city council in the state of Texas. And I promise that I'm gonna do a lot of listening. I promise that I'm going to do everything I can to be a part of a great team that's already established themselves. And we'll, I'm sure we'll make changes. I think that any changes that are made are made because you evaluate why a particular provision is in place or a law is in place or an ordinance is in place. And you ask yourself, is that doing what it was meant to do? And if it is, we'll leave it alone. If it's not, I promise I'll work hard on changing that and represent the citizens every way I can. So thank you very much. It's my honor to represent you at place one because I am unopposed as well. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Doobie. Now for mayor, place seven, Paul Velker. Okay. Well, I too want to thank the league. Uh, we always enjoy the professionalism and the, uh, the construction of these uh, forums that the league does such a good job of. And the citizens for showing up, both here and those that are watching on the internet or on your cable station. Um, my wife and I moved here over 30 years ago. Uh, Chris and I graduated from William Penn University in Oskaloosa, Iowa, and got here as fast as we could. I'm a product of Telecom Corridor. Uh, I believe that I bring a balance of both my professional experience, but also my residential involvement. Uh, I'm a common sense kind of guy. I, uh, I serve as the mayor, which is kind of like serving as the chairman of the board. Of, uh, and, and, and the council is that board, and, and our responsibility is that of oversight. Um, and I think we do a wonderful job of managing that council and the city manager form of government that is ours. I, I believe in transparency. I, I'm a firm believer in economic development so that we have jobs and opportunities for all. I think we all have neighborhoods we can be proud of and we continue to work on that. And I want cultural opportunities for everyone. It's been my honor to lead the number one city council in the state of Texas. And I'd love to be the elected mayor and I'm asking for your vote, thanks. Thank you. Also for mayor, place seven, Jared Whedon. Thank you. This city is my passion. I grew up here and always knew I wanted to raise my family here. When I got married and introduced my wife to Richardson, she fell in love with Richardson as well. Uh, and so we, we, what I believe is we need to do things to make sure that Richardson stays a wonderful place to live. Uh, and one of the things that's important to me is to make sure that the city uses debt responsibly. Yes, we do have a AAA credit rating. We need to make sure it stays that way and there's ways that we can do that. Uh, we need to make sure that if we take on more debt, that it's done through voter approved methods. If we need to do it through a bond election. If it, if it can't fit onto the budget, let's do it through a bond election, not through certificates of obligation. Certificates of obligation don't give the citizens as much of a voice. You have to come to the city council meeting and you have to get a petition in order to, to stop those. But if you give the citizens the opportunity to vote on them, then they get to choose what debt the city is taking on. Um, so, um, I also wanted to speak briefly about uh, something that we didn't address here today, which was uh, the rollback rate in the state of Texas. I don't know if you've been following this. There's a Senate Bill 2. Um, and you know, you'll hear a lot about it being a, a state's rights versus city rights. Uh, but the way I see it is the state's trying to, and, and, and to let you know, the rollback rate is, in general, what's important to you would be the uh, percentage of your property tax that you can raise from the previous year. Uh, currently, it's set to 8%. The Senate Bill 2 would lower it to 4%. Uh, and also, if you go over the 40, or, or if you, if, because the city can still raise it to whatever they want to raise it to, but if you go over that 4%, what it does is it triggers an election, giving the citizens the opportunity to select a higher rate if that's what's important. Then it's incumbent upon the city to make a case for that higher rate. If the city can prove it to the citizens, we need a higher rate, then that's fine. Prove it to the citizens, get the citizens to vote for it and get citizen input. The state's not taking that right away from us. They're giving it to the citizens, not taking it away from the cities. Um, so finally, you know, I'd just like to say that I work hard and I study hard and I don't give up. What I want to do is I want to represent the citizens. I want the citizens to feel like they have a voice in me as mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all, let's give these candidates a big round of applause. And audience, we thank you for coming out tonight and for your attention to these candidates. Candidates, again, thank you for being willing to put yourself out there for public service. We, the voters, are the voice of democracy. Election day is May 6th. Early voting starts Monday. See you at the polls.